coming up on Point Spread Weekly, powered by the Vegas Stats and Information Network. We want to make you a better handicapper, and we've got plenty of sports wagering information. Join VSIN's betting experts and odds makers as they discuss sides, totals, money lines, props, and parlays so you take sharper action. Cashing tickets is what it's all about. It's Point Spread Weekly, powered by VSIN, and it starts right now. Welcome into this week's edition of Point Spread Weekly. This is an audio sampling of our release this week of vSIN's digital publication right here on vSIN and vSIN.com, the sports betting network. I'm Brady Cannon. Nick Henyon, Triv McKenzie, and Ann Goldstone are at the controls. Karina Howe and Carlos Salas keep the show afloat from down below as we get ready to take you through the next hour of Sports Expose. Settle in, get caught up, and enjoy. Our Point Spread Weekly editor, Steve Mackin, and will join us. We'll find out the latest in horse racing from Ron Flatter as we approach ever closer to the running of the Kentucky Derby. We'll get some NBA from Point Spread Weekly contributor William Hill. And then we'll also talk the fight game with Mr. Lou Finicaro. And now, without further ado, we want to do bring in the man in charge, Mr. Point Spread Weekly himself. It is Steve Mackinnon. He is the editor of VEASAN's brilliant online publication. You can follow him on Twitter at Steve Mackinnon. That's M A. K I N E N. Steve, thank you for joining us. Good to speak with you again. And uh, I'm not sure if you have a number off the top of your head, but I got to believe if we aren't there already, we're approaching the bicentennial edition of Point Spread Weekly, aren't we? Uh, hi, Brady. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on today. And uh, yeah, this is this is actually a pretty special issue this uh, particular week. Uh, it's uh, wrapping up our third full year of Point Spread Weekly. And uh, whenever there's these, I guess if you want to call them landmark issues, I like to kind of reminisce a little bit. And it's amazing how much this publication uh, and even the other arms of the publication that have come out of it has grown since day one. Yeah, and I have seen you express your gratitude for those landmark occasions, milestones, if you will. Are we coming up on another one here pretty soon? I, I was figuring 200. We, we've got to be fairly close, I would guess. Well, we're 52 issues a year, obviously, Point Spread Weekly. Uh, I think we're about one, what does it make, 156. So uh, sometime during this next uh, annual campaign, we will uh, get to that special edition. Uh, speaking of special editions, I see uh, you've been running ads for it all along, but we're getting feverishly ready for the uh, release of the 2020 NFL betting guide from Beeson. So very excited about that. Going to be loaded with a ton of great handicapping information get people ready for the NFL season. Steve, personally, your input for the NFL betting guide, and again, for more information on the NFL betting guide and Point Spread Weekly, go to vsin.com slash subscribe. That's all a part of your subscription. The pro football betting guide, over 50 pages long. For your personal uh, contribution to the pro football betting guide, Steve, did you approach this season a little differently than you might have a normal NFL season with everything that's going on in the world these days? No fans possibly at a lot of games? Well, the only thing I'm going to be doing differently from that perspective is my strength ratings. Uh, I will be putting a little bit different emphasis on the home field advantage. Uh, it's going to be obviously not be as great as it we're used to seeing. Uh, Pack stadiums, a team like Seattle, uh, something like that where they have a huge home field advantage. Uh, these are going to be sort of glorified scrimmages. So uh, obviously you've got to take, a, take that into account as you uh, start to gauge these teams. Quantitatively, Steve, let's say uh, as far as a power rating or a home field advantage, you might give Seattle or New Orleans, Kansas City, Denver, some of these teams with big home field advantages. Now, Denver's a little bit different because there's altitude involved, not just the fans. But let's say you award three and a half, even four points, maybe. How do you adjust without the fans? Do you drop it to a point or a point and a half, maybe? Well, I tell you what, I, I don't ever for the NFL go higher than three and a quarter points. So uh, 3.25 is my highest. I believe New Orleans had that uh, last year at the end of the season. Uh, I, I'll i probably be looking at about maybe a two-point home field advantage. I'll start with something like that, and I'll obviously adjust. Uh, and based upon the other teams and how everybody's doing, how much home field advantage 
actually comes into play this season. And it's going to be a, a maybe a touch and go process. So you're deducting about a point and a half or so off of the home field advantage with the fact that there might not be any fans in the stadium. We'll get more into that shortly here. Want to remind you, this is Point Spread Weekly, VEASAN's audio sampling of our weekly digital publication. And you can get more information about receiving Point Spread Weekly with a subscription at vsin.com slash subscribe. Uh, Steve Mackin and our guest, he is the editor editor of the brilliant publication Point Spread Weekly. Steve, week in and week out, I am just floored by the amount of information that is contained in these pages. Uh, during the pandemic, we've had issues maybe as little as 35 or 40 pages. And, and when everything's going crazy under normal circumstances, I know we've had issues over 100 pages, but, it, but it's all a very easy read. It's very informational in terms of right out there in front of you. And I think you can gloss over it and, and not spend a, a world's amount of time, you know, having to digest all this information. Are, are you yourself as the editor also surprised about the tremendous content that we have delivered with this publication over the years? Yeah, and I, Brady, I've actually mentioned this a few times uh, on this show here in the last few months, how I know there was probably some internal worry, I guess, with, with the sports uh, hiatus and what type of things we'd be able to keep this publication going with. And I, like you, I've been amazed i mean we we've there's always been a futures market you know that we could talk about but it's gone so much beyond that i mean we've had entertainment pieces we've had uh pieces to keep the, the ufc stuff from lou i heard he's gonna be on the show a little later has has really kept a lot of people doing well uh with their bankrolls there so it's just been amazing i think and uh, I'm, I'm very proud that we've reached this point here three years in and maybe this last six months has been the shining star of the whole thing the top 10 gambling movies of all time right <laughs> another interesting piece i mean <laughs> the, I, I i think one of the great things is the entertainment value people can get from this we've he's also had uh mitch moss's wife and they're talking about great food locations in las vegas so uh it, it's not always sports it's not always hardcore betting you get a lot out of this publication that uh, probably goes uh, not talked about enough. Yeah, no, you bring up a great point, and we had to get creative during these times when not all sports were going on, and I was thinking of Mitch Moss's wife doing the uh, culinary uh, review as well, and then, uh, of course, I did a review of a couple local bars in town that we often frequent, Bar Canada at Circa, and then Oasis, which was the uh, spot, our uh, post-game uh, after the VEASAN golf tournament this weekend, we all gathered at Oasis for the awards and whatnot, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, that that's just another piece of this terrific publication that uh, is not only informative but also very entertaining. This week, uh, Steve, you write about baseball, uh, the NBA, and also the upcoming NASCAR race this weekend. And, and your baseball uh, article is very interesting. You have a number of situations listed where you are either backing a team or fading a team in their upcoming game based on what they did in the prior contest. And, and many of these situations that you illustrate look to me like uh, a regression play or, or banking on something going back to the norm or also a play based on um, momentum where, where a team is on a roll and, and you want to continue to ride that hot streak. These situations that you were basically uh, able to uncover, did you find them more prevalent or the same in this condensed 60 game schedule than you might normally in a full 162 game season? Well, that's an interesting take on this, Brady, and it's a, it's a very interesting question because I, I guess you can't really say. I mean, it's we're going to find out. Um, these are basically after-game systems. So a, a team comes up with some sort of extreme statistic in, a, in one game. It's how they react the next game. So theoretically, there shouldn't be a difference based upon this year's schedule. Uh, but again, we're going to see how that plays out. But uh, based upon the, the conditions of the system, things shouldn't be different. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think one that seems pretty basic uh, that would apply no matter what the circumstances are season to season is uh, backing a team in their following game if their bullpen is fresh and, and was not overworked. And then conversely, fading a team that uh, had a lot of work in their bullpen the night prior and, and is maybe uh, feeling a little gassed uh, for the next game. Uh, now, specifically, 
you mention a, a bullpen that is fresh. Does that mean no work at all, an inning or two, and then also a, an exhausted bullpen per your trends? What quantitatively, how much is exhausted? How many innings uh, would you determine that uh, that bullpen is tired? Okay, so these are one game scenarios, remember? So the, the, the situations I particularly looked at were less than an inning the previous game or more than six innings. So again, that overworked the previous day, underutilized, I guess, the, the previous day. Those are the two situations. Now, there's only a difference of 4.2% ROI from one to the other. However, it's a difference of positive uh, or making profit or losing money. So it, it goes to show you just how important uh, maybe the status of a team's bullpen is heading to a game. Well, and I think in today's game of baseball, bullpens have become more important than ever. So maybe this statistic that you're looking at, you know, a fresh bullpen versus an overworked bullpen means more now than it may have, you know, five, ten years ago. Absolutely. And this is exactly what I wrote about last week and talked about uh, on the, the show with um, Matty Humans last week. So, uh, again, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of how important a bullpen is to, to handicapping games and how I guess how it's not really emphasized in the uh, odds you look at for given games. Steve Mackinnon is our guest. He is the editor of VEASAN's digital publication, Point Spread Weekly. It comes out every Wednesday, and you can get an edition of Point Spread Weekly at going VEASAN.com slash subscribe. You can subscribe for the entire subscription. You can do just Point Spread Weekly by itself, whichever you prefer. I prefer the full uh, subscription, so you can get the 24-7 video stream, uh, also the pro football betting guide is going to be coming out soon and that is a part of the subscription again at vison.com slash subscribe uh steve want to do one more baseball question with you and i think this really is related to the shortened 60 game season we've seen some teams really surprised this year that we didn't expect to be very good in the national league the colorado rockies and then in the american league a few teams the texas rangers are hanging in there the baltimore orioles has been an absolute surprise in the al east and then also the chicago white Sox. they were kind of a pre season darling uh but they're living up to the hype right now yeah there's been a lot of surprises and actually i'm going to be writing something about this for next week's uh point spread weekly things maybe to t- it's time to change your perception on a lot of things and some of the teams you just brought up are going to probably be mentioned in that piece along with some very interesting starting pitcher uh, fades or uh or rises this season and uh things like that but uh one of the couple of things you didn't even mention teams really underperforming the Boston Red Sox. What a, what a situation that team is in right now, man. They cannot get a guy out. They're not hitting like they were supposed to. This team's in big, big trouble right now. Who would you rather have a bet on the Red Sox or the San Francisco giants? (laughs) Boy, (laughs) well, considering the, the, the prospects for the giants were never good. Even coming into the season, I, I think, uh, they're, maybe performing a little bit more as expected. Now, Boston was a team that I thought had a chance to come back if they're starting pitching, maybe performed a little better than I thought. And clearly that's not happening. Uh, And their bullpen's just as bad. So uh, probably time to jump off that train. So check out Steve's article in this week's edition of Point Spread Weekly. A lot of really interesting trends on when to back a team, when to fade a team uh, off of kind of an outlier performance and what to expect in the game that is upcoming on their schedule. Steve, talk to us about the latest uh, update for your NBA strength ratings. Uh, Did you have a, a couple of eight seeds beating a number one seed figured into your ratings? I'll tell you what, I didn't have them beating them. But if you went to, uh, if you looked at the strength ratings for those particular games, I had those underdogs at least a point and a half better than that line was showing. Uh, both Portland and in Orlando, I think the Bucks and the Lakers were really, really overpriced in those first two games. I'm not going to say these series are going to go the particular that particular way because it could be wake up calls now. But they clearly were overpriced in those first two games by at least a point and a half, in my opinion. Well, you know, I I would agree with you. I think especially in the uh, Portland Laker game, that spread got as high as seven, I believe. And I think that was certainly a buy sign on the Portland Trailblazers. Uh, And I think you bring up an interesting point there. You mentioned an edge uh, by the difference of a point or a point and a half. 
when does the green light pop on for you when you see a difference? Is it only a half point or, or does it have to be you seeing a game that you figure is off by two or three points? And where, when there's a discrepancy, when is the, what is the threshold for when you fire and go ahead and make the play? Well, I think you have to kind of take other things in perspective rather than purely using a strength rating. Now, the interesting thing about those particular games is clearly the Bucs and Lakers were going to be heavily publicly bet teams in those first two games. So when you see a rating going the opposite way on teams like that, to me that's uh, affirmation that uh, those strength ratings are probably more correct than in a game where the teams aren't quite as public. Steve, the Clippers have emerged as the favorite to win the NBA championship. Where are they? How do they stand in your NBA rankings? Well, right now they're no, number one because I had to drop. I actually did drop the box a half point yesterday for that performance. Uh, so uh, Clippers are a half point ahead of the Bucks now in the overall power ratings. However, if you look at uh, the other two ratings, the statistical ratings, which are my betters ratings, and my effective strength ratings, the Bucks are still a little bit better. And how about the Lakers? Are they in the third position? Yes, uh, pretty much across the board, third. Uh, Boston starting to creep in, and they had a pretty pretty nice run there through the uh, through the games uh, leading up to the playoffs. So uh, they they could be a factor as well. Uh, Gil Alexander, I know on his show, a numbers game Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 9 uh, a.m. Pacific right here on VEASAN, the Sports Betting Network. I know he uh, said he thinks these are the two weakest number one seeds he's seen in a long time. And he really kind of likes the Rockets and the Clippers and the Toronto Raptors and the Boston Celtics to possibly emerge uh, in the conference finals. Uh, your thoughts on that? <laughs> Those are interesting thoughts, and I, I have a lot of thoughts on what he said because heading into the, the hi, sports hiatus, the Bucks looked like one of the best teams in the last 20 years of, of the NBA. In fact, I did a, a, an article uh, during the shutdown about uh, top teams from the various leagues uh, over the last 20 years, and when I went to the NBA, the Bucks were actually number two of wow. teams from the last two decades for their statistical performance and uh, what they were bringing into the playoffs. Now, obviously, the bubble thing brought a lot of changes to the league, brought a lot of the neutrality to the playoffs. The Bucks lost a lot. The Bucks lost a lot by not being able to play in the uh, Pfizer Forum here. So um, they definitely look beatable now, and it's easy to call these teams uh, weaker now because they clearly look like it. But uh, going in, going into the shutdown, they, they were – two of the better teams that uh, have been number one seeds. Again, Steve Mackinnon is the editor of VEASAN's digital publication, Point Spread Weekly, joining us on the phone now discussing this week's issue and the NBA playoffs and his NBA strength ratings. Uh, Steve, is there a team in your ratings that you think is maybe a little bit undervalued here in the tournament in this first round of NBA playoffs uh, that might surprise some people? Well, prior to the game one loss, I actually thought Oklahoma City had a nice chance in that series. Uh, I'm not saying the series is over by any means, and I'm I'm still going to stick with them as a potential upset winner there. But uh, this is so unusual, Brady. I know this has been talked about by a lot of people with, with the atmosphere, the different type of feel going into these playoffs, and and what the what the eight games did for the teams going into the playoffs. Uh, a team like Portland, no hope before. I had them as my as a bet. I talked to JBT about this uh, at a point right before that I, I played Portland to be the eighth seed eventually, and I actually cashed a nice plus three sixty ticket on it. They played even better than I've expected. Yeah, I think they win the award for being most exciting. Dame Lillard is just unbelievable. Yeah, I know a lot of people are focusing on their their defensive ratings, but man, this team's out firing people. <laughs> hey, if you're going to win that way, that this is the time and, and, and the age to do it that way. So uh, it's going to take a lot of a, a lot for the Lakers to overcome how hot Portland is offensively. Yeah, and oddly enough, they hold the Lakers to under 100 points in Game 1. Defense has really kind of been their Achilles heel. 100-93, to the final there. They get the victory in Game 1. Let's wrap it up here, Steve, with a little NASCAR on the racetrack. NASCAR will head to Dover, Delaware for the Dry Dean races. Tell us uh, what your simulations came up with for the races this weekend. Well, this is a good race for people to bet. Dover gets a 
a handicap ability grade of A minus on my scale. It's the number five ranked track out of the 25 uh, tracks on the circuit as far as being able to use past statistics and regression type analysis to predict races. So uh, one of the interesting things here, I reran uh, the, the numbers, uh, the final uh, simulation for this week. In, in the PSW, you see the initial one. I ran, reran the final when your lineup was announced this morning. And my top four guys in it are the exact same that Pete the Stone has ranked as his favorites for this week's race. So uh, could be a, a nice sign for betters to take a look at, uh, at those four drivers as uh, potential winners. And Pete Pistone, another contributor to Point Spread Weekly, it's got to make you feel good. I, I know as a golf better, I look around at some of my peers in the industry, and, and some of the sharper guys, uh, when, they, when they're when they on the same play as me, that you know that reinforces my decision. I, I have to feel you feel similarly about Pistone. I mean, that guy's uh, as good as it gets when it comes to NASCAR. Yeah, he knows his stuff, and I, I had the um, honor of chatting with him before the playoffs last year on Sirius and uh, I was I was impressed by uh, what he brought to the table that day and I'm uh, I was so happy we were able to add him to uh, what we do with point spread weekly for each race Steve have you found any similarity I think handicapping NASCAR is similar to golf because you're playing a golf course that you know uh, appeals to certain strengths and I think it's kind of the same with racetracks you, you have a different layout so to speak every week and certain drivers are better for certain tracks Absolutely 100% agree with you on that. And I, I like what Wes Reynolds has done with his golf previews and, and showing the key stats and how those stats are affect that week's tournament. I, I think it's a very, very similar thing for, for NASCAR on these tracks. There's certain certain drivers who do better at road courses than restri- what were restrictor play tracks. The mile and a half tracks, there's guys who just typically do well on those tracks great speaking with you steve we'll catch up with you again next week this is point spread weekly on vsin the sports betting network bet on the Kentucky Derby for free? Of course you do. Sign up with First Bet, the preferred horse betting app of VSIN, and you'll get $10 to bet the most anticipated and most unusual edition of the Kentucky Derby on Saturday, September 5th. Whether you're new to horse racing or a seasoned railbird, First Bet is the app for you. Use their artificial intelligence picks to maximize your $10 free bet by finding horses ready to run into the winner's circle. Visit first.com slash bet slash Vegas 500 to learn more and sign up. And be sure to use promo code VEGAS500 to get your first $10 free bet and up to 500 more wagering in your first 30 days. The most exciting two minutes in sports is almost here, and First Bet is the only app paying you to play the Run for the Roses. Sign up today. He is the host of the Ron Flatter Racing Podcast and VEASAN's resident expert when it comes to the sport of kings. Mr. Ron Flatter joins us now. You can follow him on Twitter, at Ron Flatter. Ron, good to catch up with you again, and thank you for getting us caught up on some of the wagering advice as we inch ever closer to the run for the roses. Great article this week talking about the betting favorite, Tis the Law. And before we dive into this a little bit further, I want to know, do you have a futures ticket on Tis the Law? Do do you see a decided advantage on going ahead and moving forward with the favorite? Uh, Brady, I could have gotten him at 20 to 1, but I didn't think that that was going to be a good price at that point. It certainly looks really good right now, and that was last fall when you could have gotten him at 20 to 1. He was still unproven to me, and at that point, I wanted to see 100 to 1s. So no, I don't. That's a long-winded way of saying no, and you're not going to find a whole lot of value on him right now. I mean, the best price you can find on Tis the Law now in the futures market is even money at circa. William Hill has him at four to five. Does that mean he'll be that short on Derby Day at post time? I think not. Remember, these books have all that exposure and liability that they have to deal with. Paul Zilm at circa told me that he's really rooting against is the law. Uh, Nick Bogdanovich at William Hill says they'll, they'll probably make a little money on him. But the other side of this is, I think, on Derby Day post time, I think eight to five is roughly going to be the sweet spot for him. And if he can get better than that, uh, you know, right before the race, he might want to jump on it. 
but even money is the going rate right, right now as the best price you can find on him. And that is really the crux of your article, to be patient. It, would you advise, you know, waiting? or you, you don't think it's worth it to bet him at even money right now. You think uh, waiting, and I agree with you, come come race day, uh, yeah, he, he would think to be better than, than even money because you've got all these – it's going to develop more so and, and probably can get a better price at that point. So you're saying playing the waiting game right now is probably the best practice. Yeah, it's also less risky because let's say what happens to – Tis the law happens to uh, what happened to Omaha Beach last year happens to Tis the law. Remember, he was the derby favorite. Two days before the race, he got scratched because he came up lame. So that can happen. I mean, you don't have that protection when you're betting a futures bet. It's all in. You're, it's action. But when you're waiting for the paramutuals, you know, maybe you're still looking at it. Maybe you get six to five. Maybe that is the post-time price. But wouldn't you rather have the peace of mind knowing he's got to get out of the starting gate for it to be action rather than having something squirrely happen between now and then. Ron, I know typically when betting horse racing, you're looking to beat the favorite and find good value on a little bit of a longer shot, maybe 4-1, to 8-1, to 12-1, to one, what have you. Do you think you're going to go into Derby Day and look for a nice price on Tis the Law and jump in, or will you use him, key him, and maybe some exotics? I'll use him certainly horizontally. I might even single him and spread in other races, but... As I look at it, I mean, uh, look, I'm not convinced that Art Collector is the horse, but I'm also not going to write him off either because he just hasn't faced the same competition. Look, Tis the Law has not faced Art Collector. He's not pay, faced 1,000 words. He's not faced Authentic. Yeah, he's not faced Honor AP. Um, some of those horses have had buyer speed figures pretty close to Tis the Law, at least if you consider, okay, 95 or better, 100 or better. Tis the Law was off the charts at 109 with his run in the Travers. I get that. Five points better, and he was geared down for that. If he runs that race again, no one is touching him. But there's no guarantee. He's, he's 2-0 and at Churchill Downs this year, but he was 0-2 there as a two-year-old. So there's that to be considered as well. Uh, I'm not 100% convinced that he is the uber horse. I think he's a really, really good horse. So, yeah, I will try to beat him but I'm also not going to exclude him on all my tickets. Ron, just a few seconds left here. Is there anything to be concerned about, about the Bob Baffert camp and the recent suspension for the banned substance? Or from a betting perspective, do we just push that aside? Well, it's actually pushed aside. It's been adjudicated, and now it doesn't have any impact on the debut whatsoever. So if you like Thousand Words or Authentic, have at it. I like Thousand Words better than Authentic. And you can still get him at a price of 13 to 1 at Circa and a 12 to 1 at William Hill. The first Saturday in September. That's 2020 for you in a nutshell. Thank you, Ron. We'll talk to you next week. It is Point Spread Weekly here on VEASAN, the Sports Betting Network. Point Spread Weekly, Brady Cannon with you on VSIN, the Sports Betting Network. This is our weekly peek into this week's digital publication, an audiovisual version to give you a sampling of what we have in the written word that you can find at vsin.com slash subscribe each week. This is a tremendous publication that has all kinds of content. Here in an hour program, we're only able to touch on a few things. And joining us now is William Hill to talk about his contribution to this week's edition. William Hill writes about various topics and this week he is writing about the NBA you can follow him on Twitter at not the will Hill that's not the with two E's and then will Hill how are you sir thank you for joining us today BK what's up my man it's a pleasure to speak with you and, and you're not kidding about point spread weekly but but I'll add one more to that the whole you get your money back if you can't you you can't bet without knowing who Brady Cannon and West Brown's picking golf that's the reason to subscribe. That's that's worth your weight in gold right there. So you would do a great job, and it's a pleasure to speak with you, man. 
I appreciate the high praise there. Wes Reynolds, myself, and Matt Humans have all hit a few features this year, and those are listed each and every week in Point Spread Weekly along with head-to-head matchups. So certainly some great golf content. Wes does an amazing job, covers the European Tour too. Um, but in your article this week, William, uh, you bring up an interesting point about the playoffs and the fact that we're in a bubble. And, of course, we don't have fans. In a traditional sense, you have a favorite that might go up two games to none and then that underdog goes back to their place in front of a raucous crowd, and it's very likely that they can pick up a game and maybe two. I wonder what you're, you're familiar, of course, with the longtime NBA playoff betting strategy, the zigzag theory. Zigzag, yeah. Sure. Do you think that applies more or less in the bubble without the fans? You know, it, it, it's a learning experience for all of us. I mean, I think we all like precedent. I, I hear your write-ups and I see your, your golf stuff and you like to do, how did this guy do on the course, this course? How did he do recently? You know, we like stuff to base our bets on as betters. And we don't have that because it's such an unprecedented time with the bubble, the neutral court, the five-month layoff. I mean, you name it. There's so many, so many variables here. But my thought coming into it was, you know, I, I heard a lot of people say the neutral court would make for longer series, not shorter. And I kind of disagreed with that. I, I always thought just following the playoffs all these years, you see the team down 2-0, they go home, the crowd's frenzied, you know, they come out with their best shot. And a lot of times they get that game three, knowing if they get game four, they can even it up. And they, they have that little carrot, that little uh, security blanket of having game three and four at home. They don't have that this year. And, you know, so if you're down 2-0 and you got to win four out of five on a neutral court, and, and a lot of these guys, they've been in the bubble for almost a couple months now. You're away from your lives, your families, your homes. So I think a lot of guys are going to be looking to exit stage left once they're down 2-0. But I have to say that this first day has shook me. I was not expecting, not that any of us were, that magic win yesterday, and even Portland to a degree. So I'm a little shook by this first day, but I still feel strongly that you're going to see some some sweeps here. Well, it makes for good entertainment anyway, and uh, underdog bettors were very happy uh, with the Portland and Orlando Magic outcomes. Now, you've got a few recommended bets in your article this week as well. Talk to me about some of your thoughts on betting these teams to win the best of seven series. Yeah, one of mine was Indiana. That's one I, I, I thought I, I saw you get Miami to sweep it five to one, and then obviously there's some variance with these these scores here. You know, four to one was anywhere from plus three seventy five, plus four fifty. It kind of bounced around. I just thought coming in Miami. Well, I mean, uh, Indiana was overmatched. I thought it'd be hard for them to score. I mean, they shoot the three efficiently, but they don't shoot a lot of them. They shoot a lot of long twos. And if you just look at the best, the two best players in the series are Adebayo and Butler. They're both wearing Heat uniforms. And I just thought Miami, just, just, you know, not that the games would be blowouts individually, but I, I just thought Miami had too much for them. And, you know, Miami's a good team. I thought Miami could give Milwaukee a hard time. I think Milwaukee, I mean, uh, Miami's been an underrated team here. And I just, I don't see the punch for Indiana. I don't think they have enough juice with, with Oladipo, you know, not fully recovered from that injury. And now he has the eye issue, which I didn't know at the time, which, which strengthens my case. And Sabonis, you know, those are two guys that have been all-stars recently, that they don't really have it 100% or don't have it all with Sabonis. So I, I like Miami pretty strongly coming here in, in a short series. How about the Los Angeles Clippers? Uh, this is the team so far in the playoffs that has appeared pretty unflappable. Of course, the Lakers lose game one, the Milwaukee Bucks lose game one. I think a lot of people feel uh, that these number one seeds are maybe, uh, fraudulent is a pretty strong word, but they're, they're gettable, if you will. But the Clippers, they appear very powerful, and certainly in the Las Vegas books here and elsewhere, they have emerged as the favorite to win the title. Uh, do you think they can sweep the Dallas Mavericks? Mavericks. I do. I, I look at the Mavericks, and I wrote about it in my column this week. They remind me of a Big 12 college football team. You know, they remind <laughs> me of Oklahoma State or one of these teams. I mean, you look at the box score, and you say, this guy threw seven touchdowns, but they lost, you know, in double overtime, 77 to 72 or some weird score. I mean, they have, I guess, historically the best offense of all time, efficiency-wise. Doncic, look, if you watch him, you wonder how anybody ever passed on him in the draft. But I think the Clippers are, are, are deeper. They're they're uniquely qualified to stop Doncic with the, the perimeter defenders in, in George and Leonard and Beverly. So I think it's just a it's a bad matchup for for Dallas. And now that Porzingis, I guess he's probable for today, but he's banged up. And uh, I just think it's a good matchup for the Clippers, who are, are more well rounded. I, I compare Bama to I mean uh, the Clippers to more like Bama, more of an SEC team where look they they can run it, run up the score on you too, but they can also play on the other end, which. 
you know from watching all these games, you know, defense matters, defense wins in all these sports. He is William Hill. He contributes to our digital publication, Point Spread Weekly. You can follow him on Twitter at not the Will Hill. That's not the double E Will Hill. And William, I, I want to talk about those Clippers. It, it's odd. We, we go into a bubble situation here. The NBA shuts down for a few months because of the virus. And now coming out into the playoffs, it, it seems like we're back to where we started again. It was preseason that a lot of people felt the Clippers were the favorite back then. And it's the guys you mentioned, Paul George, Patrick Beverly, Kawhi Leonard. Of course, that defense on the wings, it still remains possibly the best in the NBA. So d- despite all the commotion and the unsettling situation that we've been through this summer, the Clippers still look to be on top. They do, but I would just caution everyone uh, just not, not to overreact. I know as someone who comes on these shows every, you know, once a, a couple times a week and I have to write every week and you guys have to do shows every day and we, we have to react to everything. There's no, you know, there's no wait and see approach when you're doing a show like this, but I, I saw the, the Lakers move to four to one and then the Bucks move down. I think that might be an overreaction. You know, I just think that's too, like I said, too much of an overreaction. You know what? You know what I think it is. I think the Warriors have spoiled us these past few years. Where we have this idea that in order to win the championship, you have to be flawless. You have to be perfect. Just because those Warriors te- Warriors teams were so damn good, especially Durant's first year, where it's like they they basically didn't lose in the playoffs. Where where most years, winning a championship isn't about being flawless. It's about being a really good team, a really talented team, but overcoming a flaw or two. So whoever wins this year is going to overcome some flaws. Even the Clippers. I mean, we could say they're the most well-rounded team and they might be but you know like they've had their issues this year they've had nights where you know the kings blew them out by 30 points at home so all these teams have warts i would be careful crossing off the bucks and the lakers just yet is that- great stuff william thank you for joining us we'll be back with some ufc talk here on point spread weekly Cite the Octagon. I love that title. If you're a regular subscriber to VEASAN and certainly you're a reader of Point Spread Weekly, week in and uh, week out, you've seen Insight the Octagon. My uh, phone ringing there, Nick. You turn that off before the show. Apologize for that. Uh, Insight the Octagon. That, that is Lou Finicaro's uh, column uh, about the UFC week in and week out. And Mr. Farrick, uh, Finicaro joins us now. You can follow him on Twitter at GamBlue. Lou, my friend, great to speak with you as always. And thank you for making time for us today on the Point Spread Weekly program. Uh, you have been on a really nice run as far as your UFC selections uh, in the publication. And the UFC during this quarantine lockdown whatever you want to call it uh was the first sport to come back early and often and you have had a nice solid profitable run during this time but uh getting ready for this show i noticed that the one week that was maybe a little bit of a slip up for you was when uh, matt humans and myself came down to uh, your house for the weekend to barbecue and hang out and watch the fights and I'm wondering, you know, that was that a little bit of a setup? That's a little bit fishy or just coincidence, sir? Well, I'm not sure. I, but if I was superstitious, I could tell you it'll be a long time before I invite you and humans back down uh, the way I've started to run since you left. Um, but that is funny that you mentioned, Brady, because I was looking at results since May 9th. Uh, they've been very fortunate. I I, uh, I don't want to change much of what I'm doing. Uh, that said, in the last few weeks, uh, I've ha- I have released some underdogs that after watching the fight, most especially last week with John Dodson, I was sick to my stomach. And betting underdogs, sometimes you're going to have to put up with some uh, performances that you don't see coming or that you surely hoped would be better. Uh, we got to understand since May 9th, favorites in the UFC are 110, 45, and 1, or 70%. So the fact that we've done well uh, betting primarily underdogs and doing what we have to do to uncover value, I feel encouraged about it, and I'm ready to try and do it again. 
Well, let's chalk that one week up uh, in May as uh, humans and I distracting your concentration. So uh, good to see you back on track there. In in your article this week, you break down a few bouts that you feel are worth taking a stance with. uh, But in the open to the article, you reflect upon last week's heavyweight matchup between uh, Stipe Miocic and uh, Daniel Cormier. And and talk to me about that a little bit. I I thought it was a really good look by you, by a couple of guys that are going to go down in history is a couple of the class heavyweights ever in the UFC. No question about it. Uh, even though Cormier will be somewhat blemished by his last two fights, not only the result of those fights, but you know the fact that he's 40, 41 years old, he's a little bit older, he, he looked a little chubby. You can't judge the book by the cover, even though that'll be some of the remembrance of him. What I'll remember of him is that he was a two-division champion, a totally uh, complete fighter that really was a natural light heavyweight that at two different times early in his career and then late in his career dominated heavyweights. Uh, so Daniel Cormier is a all-time great. Miocic gets the advantage of being a little bit younger at a perfect time to be able to take Cormier's title, or I should say best him in in the best of a three series. And so Miocic, I think, really solidifies his legacy if he walks away. If he remains to to challenge either John Jones or Francis Ngannou, uh, I think that would be really a, a terrible mistake for him, as evidenced by the fact that Ngannou and John Jones are salivating to try and get a fight with him. Yeah, I I agree with you. I have the most respect for Daniel Cormier, and his performance against Miocic did not blemish my impression. I mean, he put up a heck of a fight, really, uh, for a guy that I think was overall outmatched. Um, So, yeah, he didn't lose any respect, in my opinion. And again, well done on that piece to open the article. And then, of course, you get into this week's card. So let's do that. Frankie Edgar. I I really didn't know that this guy was still fighting UFC. It seems like he's been around forever, but a big underdog to Munoz. What do you think on this one, Lou? Well, this fight comes down to Munoz, a a natural 135-pound Bantamweight fighter uh, who is still only 33 years old, but fast, lightning quick, very powerful, and more than willing to exchange. Munoz uh, lops out at six strikes uh, per minute, but he also gets hit with six strikes a minute, which means he's he's surely willing to engage. Uh, Frankie Edgar really started his career at 155 pounds, then went to 145, now drops all the way to 135. Uh, I I talked last week about the fact that Cormier at 41, that's old for a heavyweight, and the uh, chances of them winning were 39% fighters over 38 years old in the upper divisions of the UFC. But in the lower divisions of the UFC, I think that the weight the uh, age number comes down. And so fighters over 38 years old in the 145, 135, and 125 pound categories of the UFC have realized a 136 and 172 result, a 44% result. Frankie Edgar is 39. He is old, and part of what Frankie Edgar used to be was a dynamo wrestler with great movement and striking. Now he's a dynamo wrestler, but he's lost his movement and and probably still has some striking. But dropping down two divisions, the older man against the younger natural bantamweight has me feeling that Munoz is the rightful favorite. He is Lou Finicaro. You can follow him on Twitter at GamBlu. He contributes to Point Spread Weekly for VSIN, the sports betting network. And if you need to subscribe and take a look at Point Spread Weekly, go to vsin.com slash subscribe. Lou, you also took a stab at the light heavyweight bout featuring, uh, featuring Menafield as a small favorite over St. Prue. I did. That's the co-main event that was kind of thrown together uh, because uh, earlier uh, in the month, 
we lost Yoel Romero and uh, Hall for that position. So these two guys come in short notice. Menefield off a loss in his last is like 10 and one in the UFC and he's young. He's strong. He looks like a middle linebacker, but he's green as a cucumber. He's fighting a guy in Ovin St. Peru that's 37 years old. But in this particular case, St. Peru has a vast amount of experience, a wrestling background. He's very athletic as a fighter and well more rounded and experienced than is Menafield. Yet Menafield opens up a slight favorite. I think over to fight uh, Brady and, and St. Pru, even though he has a little age on him, uh, I think he's in a real good spot to school Menafield. And as long as he s- keeps his distance and gets this fight into the second round, Menafield all swole up is going to slow down. And I think it'll be over in St. Pru's fight if we can get it into the second round. Yes. Finally, Lou, you took a look at a lightweight bout, relatively close matchup according to the odds, and that's Joe Selecki at minus 150 over Austin Hubbard. Yeah, this fight comes down to Brady, uh, Austin Hubbard having four fights in the UFC, Selecki won. Uh, Selecki uh, met a decent matchup, uh, but Hubbard has been in there with a couple of very outstanding fighters, namely Mark O. Madsen, who is a unbelievable wrestler. He happens to fight this Selecki, who's a wrestler. And many people uh, have really sided with Selecki, I think because he's a wrestler and they saw what O. Madsen did to uh, Austin Hubbard. Uh, I derive tremendous momentum for Hubbard from the Madsen fight. Selecki's not the wrestler that Madsen is, and it'll be the experience of Hubbard, I think, that'll overwhelm Selecki. Hubbard's from a great gym with tons of momentum, Gaethje's gym elevation in Denver, and his experience is going to be the difference, and you can catch him as an underdog as well as Selecki, as they open to pick, and Selecki's moved to a slight favorite now. Lou, we talked about Frankie Edgar being 39 years old old and he's been in the game for a long time. Uh, What is the typical shelf life for a UFC fighter? Do they typically last just a couple, three years or, 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 and how long has Edgar been at this craft? You know, a lot of that, that depends per fighter. The guys that stand toe to toe and bite on their mouthpiece, obviously absorb more damage and have lesser of a career as opposed to a guy like Anderson Silva, who very much like, uh, uh, Bruce Lee was uh, fluid and moved and defensive. So it's it depends on the style of fighter and what kind of wars you've been in. But it's it's easy to feel that that well-rounded mixed martial artists can succeed from 36 years old to 40 years old, uh, depending on the weight class and the matchup and who they're fighting. So it all comes down to that. I don't know that I can throw a real blanket on that, but overall, age is an enemy to a fighter. Lou, enjoy the fights this weekend. Thank you so much. And also the hockey. I know you're a big hockey fan, uh, and you're enjoying the puck passion these days, aren't you? Always enjoy Puck Passion, even in August. It's a great tournament, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting those elbows up in the corner and mucking it up with you guys here pretty soon. Anybody you're rooting for in particular to hoist the Stanley Cup this year? Yeah, I'm on St. Louis Futures in Carolina, and Carolina's in trouble, and St. Louis, I think, is starting to find their legs. Well, great talking to you again, my friend. Again, follow him uh, uh, on Twitter at GamBlue. You can find his work week in and week out covering the UFC in VEASAN's digital publication, Point Spread Weekly. Thanks again, Lou. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Brady, and good luck, everyone. That is Lou Finicaro, and once again, follow him on Twitter at GamBlue. To subscribe to VEASAN's digital publication and check out Point Spread Weekly, go to vsin.com slash subscribe. That's going to do it for another edition of Point Spread Weekly, where we give you a little bit of an audio-visual peek at our weekly publication. And folks, this is kind of like the movie versus the book. The movie's fun to listen to, fun to watch, but I encourage you to read the book. The details, the collection of information in Point Spread Weekly, week in and week out is unbelievable vison.com slash subscribe thank you thank you for listening thank you for watching we'll be back next week on vsin the sports betting network